Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Welcome back. Attachment theory has made its way into the public sphere with the help of a recent book, not surprisingly titled Attached. The theory contends that people approach intimate relationships from one of three perspectives, secure, anxious, or avoidant. We are joined by Jeff McDonald, a social psychologist and relationship scientist who is part of a small group of people doing research on singlehood. In addition to tackling the strengths and weaknesses of attachment theory, we discuss his research on singlehood and how he has identified a small group of long-term singles with an adaptive approach to solo living. As always, please rate and review the podcast and go to petermcgraw.org slash solo to sign up for the bi-weekly solo newsletter and our Slack channel, which is getting super active these days, discussing these episodes and a variety of other topics. Recent discussions have focused on solo travel, how people hate family discounts, and topics I should be covering when I start hosting solo events. Yes, solo events are coming. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Let's get started. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Jeff McDonald. Jeff is a social psychologist and relationship scientist whose research examines attachment, intimacy, sexuality, and singlehood. He completed his PhD at the University of Waterloo and is now a full professor at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks for having me. We are joined by return guest co-host Iris Schneider. Iris is a behavioral scientist from the Netherlands. After obtaining her PhD in psychology, she lived and worked in the U.S. before starting her academic position at the Social and Economic Cognition Research Group at the University of Cologne in Germany. <laughs> she studied mixed feelings and conflict in judgment and choice, and you know her from being a guest co-host on a recent episode with Kenner Lahad, in which we talked about time and singlehood. Welcome back, Iris. Good to be back. Thank you. Jeff, I am thrilled to have you here. You are doing incredibly interesting work focused on singlehood, which is a small field at this point. Mm -hmm. Most people who study relationships study the other side, if that's fair to say. They study partnerships, marriage, and, and so on. How did yeah. you end up becoming a singlehood researcher, part of a, a really small pool of people? Maybe how many people do you think in the world study singlehood? Oh, boy. Like, I mean, in psychology right now, I would say it's like three or four outside of that. I mean, not a lot. Not mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Growing, though, yeah. for sure. Indeed, as as is the number of single people. So how did you turn your attention to this? Yeah, I mean, it was in a way it was a bit of a, a happy accident, as Bob Ross would say. So I happened to on my postdoc, I met with a PhD student there. And then he just happened to contact me out of the blue a number of years later, I had been doing all kinds of research on attachment theory as as had he, he was in a really unfortunate situation where uh, his advisor had passed away. And so he was looking for someone more senior to mentor him on the project. And he had started looking at attachment and singlehood. So that's Chris Pepping, who has done some fantastic work on this and really was my entry into it. But, you know, once I started doing it, I was really influenced by the work of Bella DiPaolo. Mm -hmm, you know, she made some really yeah. important criticisms about what the relationship science field has done. And I took them seriously and at the same time had some of my own perspectives on them, thought that there was some value that I had to add on all of that. And, you know, it didn't hurt. I had been single for a long time myself and I felt like I had some personal insights, kind of like she was doing too, that maybe differed from her experiences and were worth bringing to the table. Yes, that's great. And where was this postdoc? Uh, he was at the University of Queensland when he was a PhD student. He's a professor now, or lecturer, I guess they call it in Australia, at one of the universities in Melbourne. And I always get them confused, so I'm not going to say which one. But Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. I do think, you know, my, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm trained as a psychologist, but really what I bring to the table for solo is mostly personal experience. Mm -hmm. But we're here actually to talk about largely about attachment theory, some of the work that you've done and about it sort of more broadly. I think that this 
this theory has made its way into the sort of public sphere. There's a kind of a well-known book called Attached, The New Science of Adult Attachment, and how it can help you find and keep love, right? All single people, we're desperate for love. We ha- we can't find it. We can't keep it. And here comes Amir Levine and Rachel S.F. Heller to help us solve our problems <laughs> from the lens of attachment theory. And if you can't tell, I am my tongue is firmly inserted into my cheek at this moment. <laughs> Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about attachment theory? What are its roots? And is it the dominant theory of uh, relationships? I would say it's one of the dominant mm-hmm. theories. So it's definitely highly influential. So yeah, I mean, it, you know, it started, you know, sort of back in the the fifties when John Bowlby, who was a developmental psychologist, you know, recognized some patterns amongst the the kids that he was working with, and so he developed attachment theory, you know, out of his experiences. And you know, for the record, he was, I mean, I call him like the original hipster, right? Like he was doing like Ev Psych before it was a thing. He was doing to, like he just he brought together all Ev Psych kind of is evolutionary sorry psychology. evolutionary psychology. I didn't mean to nerd out there. So yeah, he just it was a really interesting bringing together a bunch of different ideas and you know basically the fundamental idea behind it all is that it was you know it was developmental theory focused on children and the children need to do something when they feel upset you know and from an evolutionary point of view children need some kind of resource that they can go to cuz human kids are really vulnerable right and so attachment theory was based around the idea that what kids do when they're upset is they seek out an attachment figure. So the attachment system is, in theory, what switches on when a kid is upset. They get upset, that creates this attachment system switching on. And when the attachment system is switched on, you want to go out and seek closeness and comfort from your attachment figure. So like your mother, your father, whatever caregiver, right? And then what Bowlby talked about is the idea that, well, there's going to be a lot of times when you're a kid, when you're upset, and you go seeking out, you know, your mother, your father. And that what this means is that you're going to get trial after trial after trial of being upset, going and seeking your mom, your dad, or whoever, and then finding out what happens. Do they comfort you and make you feel better? Do they ignore you? Do they abuse you in some way? And so his idea was that in childhood, you eventually develop what he called working models, which is basically just these deeply held beliefs about Am I a lovable person? You know, when I turn to the people that I care about and want comfort from them, do I get it? And that tells me, do people find me lovable or not? You know, Mm -hmm. and also, can I trust people? So when I actually do open up to other people, are they good at making me feel better? Are they actually able to respond to my needs? And so out of this, Bowlby said that kids develop this sense of like, yeah, can you trust other people and are you lovable? And that this is going to influence, you know, if you think that you're lovable and you can trust other people, you're probably going to be a lot more open to connecting with people. You're going to be a lot more defensive if not. So they characterized kids into different types depending on what their characteristic reactions to these kinds of situations are. So this is so Mary Ainsworth, she was a University of Toronto mm-hmm. graduate student and professor. She developed something called the strange situation, which I always say if I have a band, I'm going to call it the strange situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually got a ban and they didn't want to call it that, which was very upsetting. But anyways, so it was just a way to test, like, can you see regular patterns in kids? And she identified three basic patterns where, you know, in the strange situation, what happens is you bring a kid in. I mean, back then it was usually a kid and its mother, right? So I'll talk in terms of like kids and their mothers. You know, the kid and the mother in this room, there's all these like cool toys for the kid to play with. But the test is what happens if the mother leaves and then comes back? Because this is a situation that should stress little kids. And we're going to find out how they manage their upset in that situation. So with secure kids, what happens is mom leaves the room and when she comes back, you know, the kid is upset while she's gone, goes to mom for comfort, mom, you know, hugs the kid or whatever. And then the kid's like, okay, everything's cool now. Hey, there's toys over there. I'm going to go play with them. So, you know, stops getting focused on mom and, and starts playing with the toys, right? Then there's anxious kids who, when mom leaves the room, is upset. When mom comes back in the room, like goes to mom for comfort, but can't be calmed down. 
Like the kid is still upset and crying. And what you see is this kind of like characteristic, like combination of upsetness and anger, right? And the idea here is that this is a kid who's had unreliable caregiving from its mom. And so, you know, it gets clingy when mom comes back, presumably because the kid's not really certain that mom's going to stay. Like their mom's mm. behavior is so unpredictable. And so this is where, you know, the upsetness is there and also the anger. Like mom is both the solution to the problem of being abandoned, but is also the, the one problem. who's doing the abandoning, yeah, right? I see. And so they call it uh, anxious ambivalence because they have this ambivalent feeling towards their caregivers. And then there's the avoidant kids who, when mom leaves the room, they might be upset, they might not. When mom comes back in the room, they're not particularly emotional. So they kind of look like they don't care. There's some evidence that su that suggests that like, you know, if you hook the kids up to physiological recording equipment, the the avoidant kids are kind of buzzing physiologically. So there is like arousal. There's there's upsetness under the surface, but that they may be kind of protecting themselves by not displaying any emotion. Because the idea here is these are the kids who've learned not to trust their caregiver, that their caregiver is going to be insensitive in the way that they deal with them and the way to avoid them being insensitive and treating you badly is to just not reveal that you're upset in the first place. So that's the that's the avoidant kids kind of like shutting down in these emotional kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. And then the reason that you know people like Amir Levine are writing these books about romantic relationships is that in about you know the 80s there was some romantic relationship researchers who started to look at adult romantic relationships and be like god you know these patterns that Bowlby was identifying these kids if you look at the way that couples deal with one another there's actually pretty analogous things going on. So there was one study that was done by Chris Fraley, you know, back in the day when you could actually go to the airport gate to see your loved one off, right? And so he mm -hmm. did this observational study where, you know, he he sat there <laughs> watching couples as they separate and identified these same kinds of patterns, right? Like some of them were, you know, upset but able to be calmed down, some of them had this very like clingy and angry kind of reaction, and some of them were kind of indifferent about the whole thing. And so so that launched this whole line of research into the idea that, well, you know, maybe attachment theory in adults actually comes from the same system as that attachment system that was active in childhood and that those lessons that you learned as a kid carry into your adult relationships and affect you the same way, where if you don't feel like you're lovable, you're going to feel uncertain and clingy towards uh, people in your adult life. If you feel lovable and you can trust other people, you'll be happy to open up and, and connect with other people. And if you feel like you can't trust other people because you couldn't trust mom or you couldn't trust dad, you're not going to trust your romantic partner and maybe even be kind of like disinterested in relationships. That's it in a nutshell. So before we get into it a little bit more, I just want to say, yes, I remember those days at the airport and like whether <laughs> whether you took the person you were dating to the airport or you met them at the airport also said a lot about <laughs> supposedly how much you were into this uh, into this relationship. Thankfully, now we have Uber. <laughs> and so we're not having yeah, I was just wondering, Jeff, when you were talking about this, when you say, so is it really the working models, is the assumption that the working models from when people were little are kind of transposed into adulthood, or is it just the use of the same system and different working models can develop over time? How I mean, stable do you think When you say is working also? models, what do you mean? The Cars? working models of whether I am a lovable person and how my caregivers slash loved ones react when I seek support in a stressful situation. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Bowlby originally, I mean, his idea was that these are – you know, ideas about relationships that crystallize to some extent in childhood. So, I mean, he kind of like hedged on this a little bit. Like he would say like they're changeable, but there's like a core of them that crystallizes. And so when I talk to my students about this, I always use the example of like an accent, right? Like the idea that like, mm. you know, up to a certain age, your accent is very malleable. And then like, you know, I lived in Australia for four years and people started telling me that they thought that I lived in Ireland, right? So I developed like a little bit of an Australian accent, but I only made it as far as Ireland. Ireland, apparently. And so that's, you know, that would have been his argument is that it can change to a certain extent, but it's gonna, but it's gonna solidify. And 
you know, a number of relationship researchers, and for whatever reason, this has fallen out of fashion now, but have thought not just in terms of like, well, maybe you've got these like central core ideas of lovability and trust that go across all of your relationships, but maybe there's an extent to which it's relationship specific, you know, so that you might have trouble you know, feeling lovable and trusting one partner, but somebody else brings a different part out in you. And so you have a different mm-hmm. relationship with them. The, there's not great evidence on it. I mean, I don't know why we don't do this stuff anymore because it's a pretty obvious question. But some of the best work that I've seen on it suggests to me that the part about trusting people can be pretty changeable from relationship to relationship. And, and the idea there is, you know, in the technical terms, that like model, that working model that involves trust is called the model of other, right? It's like, how are other people going to treat me? And of course, that's the thing that changes from relationship to relationship, right? The how lovable am I is what will be called the model of self. And it's basically, what do you think you're bringing to every relationship? And of course, that's the constant. So the the data that I've seen suggests to me that your feeling of lovability is the more constant part from relationship to relationship. And your feeling of trust is the part that's more changeable from relationship to relationship. So I, we're getting a little wonky. So I want to I want to pull back a tiny bit. So we're we're already kind of um, leaning into some of the critiques of this. So so mm-hmm. it sounds like one of the critiques is there's this essentially what you just described is this idea of adult attachment style, mm-hmm. right? So these are the adult versions of those childlike behaviors, mm-hmm. and they are being used within romantic relationships. Someone that you mm-hmm. are have an ongoing sexual romantic in interactions uh, with. And so one of the critiques is you might be avoidant with one person, you might be anxious with another person, you might be secure with another person, something like that. It may change. It's not a constant. Mm-hmm. And um, and if I hear you correctly, there's not great evidence for that. But my guess is it's, that's not easy to study yeah, right? because no. you need so, so the, I don't want to get again to that. You need a within subjects design. So you need the same person having multiple romantic relationships that take on different things. But I do think that that intuitively makes some sense. Mm-hmm. I've had relationships with women who describe themselves as jealous people, mm-hmm. but they're not jealous with within our relationship mm-hmm. because I, the way I behave towards them never brought out any jealousy. You know, like that kind of thing. So we, I think I think anecdotally, a lot of people can say, I felt secure in this relationship. I felt anxious in this relationship and so on. Well, I want to get into some of the other critiques, but let's let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the value and usefulness of this mm-hmm. theory first. Mm-hmm. I think that's before I totally throw it yeah. into a dumpster and light the dumpster <laughs> on fire. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's talk a little bit about how it can be useful, how it's been sort of useful in um, psychology, mm-hmm. and then how it might be useful for just an everyday person who's now, you know, read this read this book, understands the, these concepts. Yeah, I mean, in terms of how it's been useful for psychology, it's just a it's just a really useful way to organize and describe what people do in relationships, you know. Mm-hmm. That it's, I mean, to the extent that, you know, for example, like I think personality is a really important factor in how you relate to people. And in a way, what attachment theory is, it's a theory of personality, particularly about relationships. Like, Mm -hmm. what is the type of person you are in relationships specifically? So, I mean, for me, that's its value in the in the industry. I mean, in terms of its value for individual people. You know, like, I mean, this is one of my favorite things to lecture about. You know, you stand in front of a group of people in their early 20s and they've been trying to date and they haven't even noticed their patterns yet, right? Like, they haven't even been in enough relationships yet to be like, oh, you know how in every relationship we're always fighting? That might be me. Like, you've got to be in enough relationships in order to do that. So, you know, I feel like in terms of like, this is why I think that Amir's book attached. I mean, I do think it's a good book and I think it's a great starter for people. 
And I also think, I was thinking about like, why did I end up doing so much attachment research myself? And one of the big factors for me is that a lot of the research I do, I leave it open to the students to let them choose the path. And students love this stuff. Like mm -hmm. when you watch their faces, when you see them learning about attachment theory for the first time, you know, that experience that we've all had of like recognizing things that we've been doing our whole life, but we don't have a map for it. You know, and I think that this is why people resonate with attachment theory so much is that relationships are so important to so many people. And then as soon as you realize that there's a pattern that you're acting out, you can start to do something about it. You can kind of like maximize the good parts of it and start to do something about these things that are causing you so much grief. And, you know, there's relatively useful pictures that you can get like these anxious people that we're talking about like you know like you said these are can, like the, can i interrupt yeah. for one second can yeah, you no go worries. through just um the th the three major categories yeah um, yep. secure avoidant and anxious just so people have a yeah totally it's, that's it's, exactly where yeah that's exactly where i was about to go with this yeah excellent. so yeah yeah so so the let's start with the secure people the secure people i mean in general you know the um, good people the ones who are we all should be like those people you know <laughs> well you know i mean the thing is is that like you jest but they do have some pretty good outcomes in their lives mm -hmm. right like these are the people who on average they tend to have the highest levels of life satisfaction they trust people they feel good about themselves they have the happiest at least if you're if you're using the success of relationships as the thing that you want to know what the outcome Come for right, they have satisfying relationships. They have long-lasting relationships. One of the things that they do really well is they handle negative emotion really well because they are able to sit with it and they feel like you know if a problem gets too big, I've got people that I can turn to to deal with this. So, you know, it's not just branding. They have a they have a lot of advantages to them. You know, yeah, they're comfortable um, with intimacy. They're warm. They're exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So closeness is something that they enjoy and they're able to get a lot of pleasure out of, you know. So I think it's understandable why they have been um, why they've been put on a pedestal, as it were. Um, the anxious people, you know, they're the kinds of people who um, they would be the clingy or needy types in relationships. So, you know, the, the person who's Iris is making a face right now. She's <laughs> she knows those. She, she's dated some of those them. people. They always come to me because I'm avoidant. So they always want to be around. <laughs> me, you know, because I'm a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Freaks me out. <laughs> I have a book you could read. It's by Amir Levine. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they have this clingier, needy style, right? Where like, you know, they, they have this, this tricky internal tension where they just, they really, really want to be loved, right? Like that's what it comes down to is that they really, really want to be loved. But my sense is that it's not that they want to be, it's their, their motivation to be in a relationship. Like it's, it's not so much because they really love the joy of connecting, but they feel like it's going to heal them. Right, like it's a it's a way to feel better about themselves at the end of the day. It's it's a narrative. There's a narrative, right, which is that love cures all, love conquers exactly. all. That if you can manage to do this, everything will start to fall into place. You complete me exactly. And yes. so this is why you know you can understand why, for example, there's relatively high levels of conflict in their relationships because when they get into a relationship, they're kind of expecting that this is going to be the magic elixir and then they continue to feel bad even when their partner is there. The partner is mm -hmm. the one who's supposed to be making them feel better. So who wouldn't get angry at the person who's supposed to make you feel better making you feel worse, right? And, yeah. and God forbid that person spends a lot of nights in the lab like Iris and they're not around. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're mostly women, though, you know, like women friends who I was going to ask you about friendships, because I think these patterns also turn up in friendships. I got this like from, you know, female friends who then yeah, became a little bit clingy. Yeah, they. I mean, you know, I haven't really studied friendships very much per se, but it's this whole dynamic. I mean, it should be around wherever the place is that you go to get emotional comfort, 
you know, that that's the person who you're going to have the most intense feelings about. And so, you know, we study that a lot in terms of romantic relationships, because for a lot of people, that's kind of where they put their chips. Like that's where they're going to go when they're feeling down and feeling they're most vulnerable. But, you know, there's some work by Alexandra Fisher that just came out recently, for example, that showed that single people, they start kind of calibrating this stuff to their friendships. Like those become the most important relationships to them. And so friendships start to push their buttons, start to trigger them because that's where their expectations for connection and comfort are. Um, yeah. Can, can we return? I want to return to friendships as we get to some of the critiques, if I if I can. But certainly, I think, yeah, you can see the parallels with regard to, to anxiousness. And then the last one is this idea of Yeah, avoiding. so these are the avoidantly attached people. And so these are the kinds of people who... You know, relationships, they're, they're, the story that they'll tell you is that the relationship isn't that important to them, right? That they've got other things that are the higher priorities in their life, that they're not that concerned uh, about closeness, that they really have this identity built around like independence and self-sufficiency. Um, so, you know, you, you buy a box at the <laughs> hardware store that says needs two people to lift. The avoidant person is going to be the person lifting that by themselves because they don't want to need anybody else. And they... Um, Wait, why do yeah, you they, say this is the story they tell themselves? Well, this is like, you know, I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too nerdy about this, but this is the big debate in the literature right now is like, where does avoidance come from? Does it come from you actually want this closeness, but you've got some kind of a defensive mechanism to stop you, right? So remember mm -hmm. when I was talking about the avoidant kids, like when mom comes back in the room, some of the data suggests that it's not that they're not worked up. Like if you measure them physiologically, they are worked up. But the uh, you know old attachment theory story would be that they're hiding that because if I show mom how upset I am, I'm going to get in trouble basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we've got some work in my lab that kind of suggests that like, well, maybe it's not that they're scared of opening up because they're afraid that they're going to get hurt, but maybe they're just genuinely disinterested. But it's really hard to distinguish between those two. Like, that's the trick. Yes. Yeah. You know, I cite this data a lot, and I'm going to do it again, but it, it, of United, in the United States, adult singles, half are not interested in dating or relationships at the moment. And top two reasons, you know, it's like they have other things they want to do. And there was something else that sort of is a positive one, right? So it's not that these people can't make it happen. It's just they have other stuff happening. It's not a priority for them at this stage and, um, and so on. That goes a little bit with this other perspective. It's just there are other important things to do. There's other values that they have and so on. I want to actually talk about this as kind of sort of my overarching critique, mm -hmm. and I want to get your, your reaction, I want to hear what Iris thinks ab about this, is that, so there is an underlying belief, and that is that relationships do solve problems. Mm -hmm. That having a close, intimate relationship is better for you than not, mm -hmm. is the sort of idea. Now, I think that there are two problems with that. One is the data don't, I don't think, support that very much. Mm -hmm. Right. So so the work by Bella DiPaolo, for example, right, suggests that, yes, when you look at married people versus single people, married people are happier, but it's not a marriage effect. It's rather the opposite is that happy people tend to get mm -hmm. married and stay married. Mm -hmm. Unhappy people are actually the ones who who get divorced. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so so there's this sort of idea that I like, oh, we're supposed to be doing this. And if you're not, there's sort of something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I think that that there are a certain amount of anxiety or, or let's say skepticism, maybe might be the right word, actually, I think can be really healthy because while relationships can be incredibly uplifting and wonderful, as, as we know, and, mm -hmm. and growth oriented and, um, and fun and delightful and, and great companionship, they also can be abusive. Mm -hmm. They can be really, you know, unsettling. They can inhibit growth. We know that they have um, throughout history been associated with like oppression, especially of women. And and as we find that the more sort of egalitarian the world becomes, the more women sort of are opting out of mm -hmm. of this path and so on. And so I, in some ways, question the premise right? That this is a good thing. And then I actually invite a little, like, I think a little bit of like, well, I just want to be, 
there is a certain amount of cautiousness that should go along with the deep attachment that, that can happen with regard to a relationship. Um, that's my first critique that's there. And, and related to that, I think is what it, what it does is it's, it's lacking. It's the avoidant. Like, I don't even like the term avoidant because it is re relevant. It's relative to the idea of attaching. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's not a good, I, I want a fourth category which is sort of the securely single category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's oh yeah, not totally. Yeah. So, yeah. so what are your reactions to the, to that perspective? Yeah, I have a lot. Good. Um, yeah. Um, well, okay. So first of all, in terms of like, just the prem, like the premise of like, is it better to be in a relationship or not? Um, you know, I, I, here's maybe where I take a little bit of a heel turn in terms of your audience, but like, that's cool. Um, I see the data a little bit differently than Bella does. So in my read of it, like, I think that the broad critique is right, that the benefits of relationships have been oversold. Mm -hmm. My read of the data is still that um, even when you compare like people who've never been married, who, you know, I think Bella would say that you're going to get more of the single at heart people in that kind of group, mm -hmm. um, that the average effect is that still... Uh, there's more evidence in my mind that the married people are happier than the than the never married people, right? Um, but especially, you know, when you look at like divorced people, for example. I mean, divorced people are consistently have the worst outcomes, and you know, I mean, I've I've said this to Bella on Twitter. Like, do you know what the number one predictor of divorce is? It's getting married, right? Yes. Like, divorce actually does seem to have long last or not long lasting, but some stable negative effects on people. So, yes. you know, at the very least, I would certainly say that if you decide to get into a long term relationship or get married, you're rolling the dice. You know, you might have some really good outcomes and you might have some not so good outcomes. And in general, right, like this has been try. This is the perspective that I've, I've tried to take on it is you've got to really think about there's no one size fits all here, right? That there are some people for whom I think relationships are genuinely going to make them happier and healthier people, right? I, I also think one of the things that we need to be thinking about is what's the what outcome are we talking about? Like, are we talking about just happiness? Like, that that's important, but kind of like you alluded to, there's some people in in various situations who their main goal for say getting married or getting in a relationship is because they don't you know they don't have a lot of money, for example, yes. and like Survival. that kind of partnership, sure. right? And so we also need to be thinking about like you know maybe happiness isn't the isn't the only reason why a relationship can have benefits for people. But yeah, I mean you know I so Bell and I think see I see I think see it a little bit differently in terms of like. Is there an advantage to being in a relationship or not? But at the very least, for sure, it's if it is an advantage, it's a lot smaller than people thought, and we really need to be thinking about different types of people. And so, you know, with Chris Pepping, when we've been doing this attachment stuff, we've been looking at these different classes of attachment in singlehood, right? And we did find, um, and we're working on a paper on this right now, uh, a group of securely attached singles. So people who are, you know, they're single and they have really good life outcomes. They're really happy with their life. You know, they're, there's, you know, like they're not depressed, all that kind of stuff. But I do think it is going to be really important to distinguish between the secure singles and the avoidant singles because in our data, you know, what we get with the avoidant people, the, the avoidant singles is what they're saying my read of their data is, I'm not unhappy being single, but I am less happy with my life overall, right? So I don't think that we should kind of like just leave the avoidant people be and say like, you know, you're happy being single and so everything is fine. There's something going on with avoidant people, but it's not dissatisfaction with being single. And I think that's where they differ from the secure singles is that the secure singles will tell you that I'm happy being single, um, you know, and overall my life is fine. So I do think it's important to distinguish between the two. Yeah, and there is some – so is it Bartholomew and Horowitz have mm -hmm. this relationship questionnaire which adds the category essentially that I, I think that we want? They right? well, they they actually had the category that we really don't want, which is the, which is the fearful category. So those are the people who are like um, anxious and avoidant I see. Um, at the same time. Yeah. But they have an item which is I'm comfortable without – Close emotional relationships is important to me to feel independent and self sufficient. I prefer not to be depend on others and have others depend on me. Right? Is the that's yeah. the avoidant one? That's the avoidant that's one. There. Yeah, yeah, that's there. I see what you mean. But yeah, we don't. So there's not a really great way to have this secure single one measured yet. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, what we've done so far is we just, you know, we basically give the regular attachment scale to single people, and we kind of see what are the secure single people like, and they do. They seem to be, they seem to be, be fine. And I mean, you know, I mean, to be honest, for me and like both my like personal and professional philosophy on all of this, like, I think that we need to deprioritize the question of are you in a relationship or not, and what we need to prioritize is are you taking care of yourself. Like for my money, the people who do well single in many ways are the same people who do well in relationships because you know they do things like uh, regulate their emotions really well, or you know they're conscientious and so they can take care of themselves. You know, and that's kind of what we talked about with Kinneret as well, right? Like, can you parent yourself? Mm -hmm. Can you take care of yourself properly? Is maybe a more important question because I think there's two things that stood out to me and one is that we talk about close relationships but what you actually mean is close romantic relationships yeah there's one right? one relationship and, and it's dominant. only one kind of relationship yeah. and of course the focus on that it's often sold a little bit as the most relevant evolutionary relationship And it kind of is, but we also know that other types of relationships, for instance, with grandparents and with, you know, uh, allo mothers and uh, brothers, sisters, friends are also very um, important. So broadening a little bit, like can people have healthy relationships or not, instead of focusing only on can people maintain this particular romantic relationship style that we all value and that we want to have like kind of formalized in marriage versus other statuses in society i mean i don't i don't think that's so so helpful in understanding what you you also alluded to um people's well-being and the other thing is i think you know um What they say about vegetarians, that people are vegetarian, but usually not all of the time, all of their lives. And that's, of course, the same with relationships, right? So single people are not probably not single all their lives. There's very few people, I think, who are single all their life, who are never in a relationship. So we can't really categorize them uh, permanently, only temporarily, mm -hmm. I would Suggest So I think that's a little bit of difficulty with, you know, to talk about yourself, which I think is why attachment theory now is taking off also popular, because it's an easy way to convey to somebody, hey, this is what I'm like, mm -hmm. without, you know, having to put your soul on the table, like, oh, by the way, I'm avoidant. Yeah, that's, you know, just so you know, and it has like this lightheartedness. But of course, if it's only focused on romantic relationships, sometimes we're in them, sometimes we're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably true for most people. Yeah, yeah, I think this this idea, you know, I, I, I like that you, you there's sort of this thing about, again, right, what gets measured gets managed, right? And so I like this idea of, are you good at life, right? And mm -hmm. if you're good yeah. at life, now you're likely to have, yes, you're likely to have relationships that are more stable, And so I mm -hmm. often think the arrow is headed in the other direction, right? So rather than those people who have the false narrative of you complete me, you're going to solve all of my problems. Instead, if you're like, I've got my problem solved. And so then now I'm, I'm actually a better partner because, boy, it's already hard enough to parent yourself. And then you have to parent your partner on top of it. And then all the downstream negative effects of that, like who wants to have sex with the person you're parenting, <laughs> you know, right? Like... Yeah, I just want to echo I just want to echo that point. And then the other one is, you know, people are often single on the other side of relationships. So mm -hmm. one group that says they're not interested in dating or relationships at the moment tend to be older women. Mm -hmm. These are women who already had a marriage. You know, and they're just like, I don't want to have to deal with that again. I have other things that I want to do with my life. And, you know, and they're often rich friendships and mm -hmm. connections with children and connections with family and connections in the community and connections in their church and, and so on. And I just think I'm just like, I would not want to, right. I don't know how to classify those people because they're not even seeking that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. So they would probably fall into an avoidant or a se secure single. And I think a lot of people would say, oh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see anything about their lives that's too bad. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 really going to vary from people to people, right? I mean, some mm -hmm. people, lots of people, find themselves in that situation, and they're perfectly content, you know. Um, and some people struggle with that, and it, you know, I mean, it depends in part. I mean, I think this is one thing that the pandemic has made me think a lot about is that, you know, 
even if you're single, um, it doesn't mean that relationships aren't important to you. And I think that's what kind of what you're saying, Iris, is that like, you know, even if it's the romantic relationship that you're not putting all of your chips on, you know, mm-hmm. like we just we just finished one study in my lab where um, you know, we're basically trying to figure out like what's the big priority for people when they are thinking about what their ideal single life be. And the first thing that they said before dating or sex was family. You know, so there's mm-hmm. all kinds of other relationships that people can tap into, but I do think that it was, you know, some single people got a bit of a rude awakening during the pandemic, because you know people build these relationship infrastructures in their life, and that got disrupted for a lot of people. I mean, mind you, a lot of people in relationships, you know, got too much of their partner, and that's like a, another issue on the other side of it. And right? their kids, but, and kids. <laughs> they're right. like, oh my god, I understand what it means to be a parent now because I have to do it all the time. <laughs> Versus outsourcing. Or I should have done it better so far. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I guess I guess the broad point for me is that, like, you know, I, I think that we have been a very particular time in the, in the recent past where a lot of relationships have been available to people. And I do think sometimes, like, you know, why is it that romantic relationships have been put on such a pedestal? And, you know, from my perspective, I assume that there's good historical reasons for that. Like, it was, you know, I don't know, like 100 years ago, it, you didn't have, like, meetup groups to like you know get together with on a regular basis it would have been harder given that you know the hypo- the idea here is that like single people want relationships but want relationships that are relatively easily accessible i just i assume i'm not a historian i'm telling a total uh, just so story here uh, right i yeah i want to push back on that that story. Yeah, i think that. that's the story that we find i think that's the story uh-huh. that we find but really you know i think that this first of all is a relatively new invention the love marriage mm-hmm. and and maybe it is superior to an arranged marriage which which preceded it but a lot of this again i think you know as i said it's hard to take gender out of this in the sense of like the history of marriage is incredibly oppressive to women and so i want to you know so like basically women were owned by their husband you know for much of the history of marriage and so i just as much as we enjoy a jane austen novel i want to be you know i just sort of want to say like mm, and then also throughout the all of human history, marriage is a relatively new invention that's there. Now, so, I mean, yeah, that doesn't yeah, mean yeah. that closeness, right? Also, And also we know rates of infidelity. And so people sought out other types of relationships, perhaps for intimacy or for good sex or for support yeah, yeah. or whatever it is. So I, I just think that... I, I'm just a little bit cautious about, again, the premise of all of this stuff, which is there is this one type of relationship that... that um, oh, yeah. No, no, sense. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but for I, sure. And I also think, Jeff, you know, where you said about the pandemic, I think what stood out to me most is that you start to see, again, I think, coming to this theme, which people can take care of themselves and which people actually cannot, you know, that they rely a lot on external structures but also sort of satisfaction that they get from being at their job in their jacket in their role you know with their status and now they're on the in the kitchen table uh, constantly i think i think this was really interesting for me to see how people coped with basically being by themselves and, um, yeah and you know i do think the last thing about the pandemic you know i haven't been too focused on the pandemic because I mean, I think, yeah, I th- people are like, oh, it's going to change everything. We'll see, you know, kind of thing. But I like to cite this. It was illegal to go on a date in San Francisco during the pandemic, right? So you were you were forced into isolation as a single person because you were not allowed to spend time mm-hmm. with someone who wasn't a family member or part of your household. We have this view of single people as um, as being alone a lot, but actually that's not necessarily the case, right? You know, we we know from the literature that single people are actually more connected. They have more friends. They're more involved in the community, and so that that had this sort of isolating effect. I push back on the notion that, well, if you just had a family, <laughs> you know, it'd be okay. Uh, you know, in the sense of like, no, it actually had to do with. The solution isn't to have a family. The solution is to have a sort of more progressive way to deal with not having people be so isolated, mm-hmm. you know, locking them down in that sense. Hey, solo listeners. You know Julie Nervelli from her frequent appearances on the podcast. Well, her latest entrepreneurial venture, Bachelor Girl Productions, is now a sponsor. Bachelor Girl makes fun, flirty t-shirts that serve as an icebreaker when you are out and about. 
Let the world be your dating app with messages such as spoon size matters or all flirts welcome. You can also wear your bachelor girl t-shirt on an actual dating app picture. I recommend the message swipe right for that purpose. Just go to bachelorgirlproductions.com and use discount code SOLO for 20% off your order. That's SOLO in all caps at bachelorgirlproductions.com. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Bachelor Girl. I guess for me, in a sense, the broader point that the pandemic brought home for me, and this is, I mean, this is going to be true, I think, for people in relationships and people who are single. My sense was that it was something that was sometimes more acutely felt by people who were single is that, you know, I do think that there is a greater level of social dependence that we all have as individuals. And in some ways, it was masked by things like the economic system, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, there were ways for us um, – you know, uh, uh, our dependence on others, you know, like you could hire somebody to come in and clean your house just as one example. And there's an option that's taken away from you. right? And so, you know, a sense of independence you have that, you know, because I can do all of these things when those level of connections with other people were broken and you find yourself having to take care of yourself in an even more intense kind of way. I think it just kind of made clear, like all of us are dependent on each other and we don't always think about that. And I think that, I think that might've been something that had been made more salient. Yeah. I guess we'll also see you know, about what happens to divorces also. So mm-hmm. I, I think what issues is there's probably it's a magnifier, right? Again, if you have challenges, they become magnified, whether you're in a relationship or not in a relationship. The, really, the overarching idea here is that there's not just one path or one place yeah. developmentally that is yeah. the case. I want to return to a couple of the critiques of this before we get into some more of your research. Mm-hmm. So you told the story about children and adults, and mm-hmm. the the theory connects the two. You learn mm-hmm. a style as a child, mm-hmm. and it, it then persists into adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, that seems to be, I I don't want to say naive, but but I'm I'm suspicious of that. Yeah, I mean, in 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 my estimation, you should be. It's, I mean, one of the, somebody said this, and I wish I could remember who said it to me because it, it was such a wise thing is that, you know, they said basically like, why is it whenever you encounter a psychological theory of anything, it starts with the premise that this started in childhood. Mm-hmm. And this person's point was, well, just Freud got there first. And so, you know, we've all been sort of like correcting from Freud the whole time. If like, you know, an evolutionary psychologist or someone from a different perspective, if a geneticist had gotten there first, that's what we would be kind of like moving away from, right? Um, And, um, you know, Bowlby, he was a psychoanalyst. And so that was going to be where he was going to start from. His founding assumption was going to be that this came from childhood, right? Um, But the data that have been coming in, I mean, the, the... problem is, is i'm gonna nerd out a little bit please it's it's, it's just like wait hold on you you've been holding back <laughs> <laughs> i have not yet reached my full form it's frightening when i do <laughs> um <laughs> that it's really hard to test this data to test this kind of an idea right the kinds of data that you need is you need to get kids in their childhood you need to look at how they interact with their caregivers you then need to come back to them like 20 30 40 years later and then get an assessment of like how similar are they in terms of their security or their insecurity from childhood to adulthood right so when you think about like people only started paying attention to this stuff in adults and like the mid 80s you know so even if you start that research in like 1985 your first data set isn't going to be ripe until like 2005 right so there's just not a lot of good data on this issue of like how much is this a childhood thing um but as the data has been coming in and again like chris fraley is the guy who i think has done the absolute best work on this stuff um you know the there is consistency between you know, how your parents treat you and the kind of security that you have in as an adult, but it's a lot smaller than you would think it is. You know, like it's, um, I mean, in statistical terms, it's a correlation of 0.15, which is, which is not nothing, right? Like, if you think about like, 
<laughs> yeah, for sure, right? Um, and you know, it's 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 to get anything that's consistent over a twenty or twenty five year period, like that's impressive. But you know, if you're really hardcore, like the way that my mom treated me is one to one, the way that I am as an adult, you're not going to expect it to be that small, right? Um, and and even then, like even when you see, because you know, there's a little bit of evidence that like, you know, if your parents treat you sensitively, that you're more likely to grow up to be secure. But even that doesn't prove that your parents treating you sensitively caused you to be secure. It could be that you've got a parent who's low in neuroticism, and so they're like a pretty emotionally stable person. You inherit their emotionally stable yes. genes, and then you grow up to be emotionally stable, right? So it's really, I, I wouldn't say that the evidence for the childhood part of it is super strong and you know it's it's funny when i when i started doing attachment research i was pretty zealous about it like i was like that guy who like you put the map in front of me and it's like i see the way the truth and the life finally right and i remember somebody early on said there's really good feminist critiques of attachment theory because the argument was what you're doing is taking people's problems and unfairly blaming mothers for them essentially. Mm -hmm. And I remember being, I was so deep in this stuff at the time that I felt I was kind of dismissive of that. But it makes a ton of sense, right? Like there's been tons of blame that have been heaped on parents and mothers in particular without a lot of solid data that that's where these attachment styles come from. And so, yeah, I would say that there's not no influence of childhood, but it's a lot less than than people think it is in, in my business. That's my sense of it. Yeah, much, 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 much less is the way I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. What about, I mean, you know, to me, there's also a more proximal thing, which is just, you know, one of the things that as young people, and I've talked about this with my own personal experience. I'm curious what you think, Iris. You know, my parents had a terrible relationship. I mean, a terrible relationship. Like they never should have married. Mine didn't have um, a relationship. And they weren't good in it. They weren't good after it. They did thankfully produce me and my sister, so I'm not going to hold it against them too much. Um, but there was never a model of a loving, close, intimate relationship for me. And so I never saw that even as the solution, mm. you know, in mm. that sense. And I'm sure that came, that has um, led at least in part to my comfort and desire for for single living or the fact that i see a close intimate relationship as optional for me i like i'm not against it that's why i don't like that idea of avoidant i'm not against it mm -hmm. but i'm but i also don't think that it's sort of it, it's in any way necessary that is that i don't i don't see it as a better path path mm -hmm. i just see it as a different path and so so um but is there evidence for that like that's the connection to childhood that i think might be interesting yeah, we, I, you know, I haven't seen any sort of evidence directly on point with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, yeah, I talk to the, to people about this stuff a lot, um, but you know, I, I've I've heard that narrative, and I've heard exactly the opposite narrative, which was, you know, I saw that my parents had a difficult time, and that's when I vowed to have a relationship that was like mm -hmm. exactly the opposite of that, right? Um, so I don't know, work I don't that know. much harder. Yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. And so, I don't know, for me, it's it's kind of just, you know, we have our goals and motivations and then we tell stories that support that those are the right goals and motivations to have, right? Yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's maybe also how why it's so attractive, right? This attachment theory that people just love it. They see something that they do and they realize, okay, there's a name for that. There's a label mm -hmm. for that. There's other people who also do that. And some people might resign themselves in that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just avoidant. Deal with it, uh, you know, in a relationship. But I think maybe one way to kind of have this this childhood influence in there is it depends a little bit on what kind of values you develop as a child right so i think like you peter i developed strong need for autonomy mm -hmm. i think that was always there i think that's one reason why my parents weren't together because they both also had a strong need for autonomy and i also developed this so in you know later in life just don't have such a strong strong goal in relationship but rather in things that satisfy this autonomy kind of desire and value um and and relationships are difficult i think to maintain if you don't have somebody who can appreciate the same types of values mm -hmm. so somebody with strong autonomy needs 
needs to find somebody who also has these strong autonomy needs in order to get along and be interested enough. Indeed. You know, I, I, uh, let's, let's wrap up the attachment stuff. Um, I, you know, my last critique of it, and I, I probably have alluded to it, but I'll try to say it a little bit better, is I lament the fact that there is not a positive term for people who are not pursuing a close, intimate relationship. Or, you know, in, in, in that sense, it's not that they're avoiding it. It's just that they are they're secure in their singlehood. And I, I think that the – and so to me, the issue is there's sort of a, a pinnacle, you know, in which everything is being um, evaluated relative to that, mm -hmm. um, you know, versus a security dimension that falls along a relationship, non-relationship, mm -hmm. a continuum. I feel like that's one of those things that we might be watching change in real time. You know, like I think that one problem that those of us in psychology have is that we think that we're studying like unchanging eternal aspects of the human condition. And really what we're doing is sociology studies where we, you know, we do a, a study at one point in time and we're not paying attention to the fact that like it's so embedded in a particular social context. And so, you know, one of the things that's come up in the work that I've done is that um, and, and, you know, again, Alexandra Fisher has done some stuff on this too, is that singlehood compared to other identities that you can have, right now, the average person doesn't have it as a particularly strong identity. I yes. suspect that that's something that's changing, like stuff like this podcast is, you know, bringing people together around an identity of singlehood. And I think that as communities develop like that, those kinds of those kinds of terms and labels will just inevitably come out of that as a way to make sense of the way that people like your community are thinking about this stuff. So, you know, I, I think that that's coming, um, but that's kind of just a product of, of where we've been as a society so far. But yeah, definitely. I think that we're. I think that you know we're sitting here watching it change. We're participating in the change right now. We're making the change, Jeff. We're making it. <laughs> exactly. Be the change you want I to see in the this. world. Be the change. <laughs> yeah. I talk about this as a movement. So yes, I think that's right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your about your work because you have um, done some work on on these different forms of attachment, mm -hmm. um, but you also. You also look at what what you call long term singlehood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and and look at it in a way that is is to use this term ad having adaptive set of behaviors associated with it. Can you talk a little bit about your work in this way? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we've just again, right? Like, like my motivation behind all of this has been. Um, I just feel like people talk about single people as if there's just one type of single person, mm -hmm. and. You know, I'm really interested in individual differences, right? Um, different strokes for different folks, as it were. And so I was interested in what are some of the different types of single people out there. And mm, so, you yes. know, this is why one of the reasons I think that this started with attachment theory is that if the question is what are different types of people, attachment theory is one way of thinking about, well, here's one way to categorize different types of people. But in general, what we've been interested in is if, if single life is for some people and not for other people, what can data tell us about who single life is for and who it's not for? So this is where, you know, in, in my read of what my field has been doing, we'd been thinking a lot about, you know, where do single people get social support? And so, you know, how good is your relationship with your friends? How good is your relationship with your family? That kind of thing. And it's like, well, that's a little bit Victorian. I mean, what about sexual needs, right? Like yes. sexual needs are important to people, but there wasn't a whole lot of literature around, you know, what's the importance of people satisfying their sexual needs? Um, can, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah, by all means. One way that you make marriage an appealing institution is as follows. You can only have sex if you're married. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what ends up happening is you go, well, I want to have sex. And you're like, I guess mm -hmm. this is the way to do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, and sort of, and so, uh, yeah. So thank you is, <laughs> is what I'm saying is, you know, we have these kind of, you know, you, you, you read Jane Austen. I, I look, I, you know, I pick on Jane Austen a lot, you know, but you're like, and it's just like, oh, it's this romantic, fulfilling, you know, banter filled kind of thing. And some people are like, I am horny and mm -hmm. I have no other way to satisfy this. So I guess here how we go, you know, here's how mm -hmm. it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we're seeing 
well, I'll just stop there. So, so recognizing the multiple motivations by which someone might couple up, we've already acknowledged one earlier. I can't pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, so there are many ways that, that, that people either reasons they pursue partnership and reasons why they pursue singlehood this there. So I'm, I'm sorry to go on a rant, but no, I, no, that's, I, I mean, think that's, this is that's, a great, it's a great observation. That's a, that's a much more passionate version of the way that I was going to put it. Um, <laughs> is, you know, and I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much it's been like structured on that way to meet particular goals, but in terms of like, you know, like this is the thing, there was a study by Amanda Gesselman a couple of years ago, and it was asking single people what they thought the the life of people in relationships was like, and what people in relationships thought the life of single people was like. And people in relationships, according to that study, they think that single people are having this wild sexual time, right? When the data are actually pretty consistent with what you're saying, which is that the majority of sexual activity is happening in the context of committed relationships. And so, um, you know, it makes sense that one reason why single people might be motivated to get into a relationship is exactly like you're saying, like that's where the more consistent sexual opportunities are. So that was the thing in in the study that I did with my amazing grad student, Yubin Park, that I found really interesting was that, you know, when people were happy with their friendships, they, that was related to being happier with being a single person, but it wasn't related to whether you wanted to get into a relationship or not. In our data, it was the people who were happy with their sex lives who both These are said, single people who are happy with single their sex people lives. sorry yep single people who are happy with their sex lives who said i'm happy being single and i'm less interested in getting into a relationship so they you know if you if you've got a sexual infrastructure is a single person then you <laughs> that feel that's the first time i've ever heard that <laughs> that's phrase. because i made it up <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to add that I'm like please i'm going to put that into my dating profile like, looking <laughs> Looking to add people to my sexual infrastructure. Holy my, <laughs> my royalty rates are reasonable, so uh, I think you can afford to do that comfortably. Uh, I'm not sure you want <laughs> cited McDonald 2021 <laughs> after that phrase. Personal that's, communication. If that's the only thing on my Wikipedia page when I die, then I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm so sorry. I just yeah, couldn't let that okay. slide. Um, yeah, that like I mean, if you've got a way to satisfy your sexual needs outside of a romantic relationship, it seems to really take the edge off of wanting to be in a relationship. So, I mean, it's exactly in line with what you're saying. People, sexual people, go where the sexual opportunities are. You know, um, and the majority. You know, a lot of our data we collected during the pandemic, and so like I'm, I'm not sure how much this is going to be the case when when the pandemic wears off. But in our data, like 70% of single people were not having sex at all. There was a mm-hmm. lot more sex going on in relationships. And so it's the attraction in that sense is understandable. Now, mind you, I will say the one asterisk I'll put next to that is that we had a little bit of data in that study suggesting that the single people who were having the most sex, they said they were least interested in having a relationship, but we're actually the most likely to end up getting into committed relationships. Well, yeah. You know why? Because sex is a gateway to love. I call, it the, I call it the genital heart connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would have a more parsimonious explanation. If they are meeting people to have sex with, they're probably meeting more people. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. So, yeah, it's more likely but, that they but, meet. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, also the thing is this. So you start having sex with someone and then you start spending time with the, some, that person. Then you end up liking that person. Exactly. And then, you know. And, exactly. And so you have sex these, with them and then you end up liking them. And then you end up liking them by by instead of the opposite, which is you like them and then you get to have sex with them, right? Later, in a sense. I have a friend. She, I swear to God, she's like, I have sex with with um, the man as quickly as possible if I like him. And she's like, I want to figure out is the sex any good? Why spend all this time figuring out whether we like each other or not, and then and then find out he's terrible in bed, and so. Um, I, you know, I do, there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of things that get wrapped up. What you're describing, Jeff, is like we have these assumptions. They they tell a story. Mm-hmm. And um, and then also there are a lot of judgments, um, you know, around things like casual sex. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and so um, that that, for example, is seen as a bad thing. You know, because it goes against. So I don't know. I I don't know how much you're familiar with this this term that we use on the podcast a lot from Amy Garrett about the relationship escalator. Mm-hmm. 
right? Mm-hmm. And so, so you know, any time there is some yeah. deviation from one of the hallmarks of the relationship escalator, um, kind of mainstream relationship escalator people see it as wrong, weird, strange, um, because each of those hallmarks serve a particular purpose, whether it be sort of kind of sociologically, culturally, and and so on, right? So one of one of those things, for example, is like monogamy, right? Monogamy is good. Non-monogamy is bad. Well, why is monogamy so good? Well, it helps to know that that child is my child, Hmm. you know, and it helps because it, it tries to crowd out other people who might threaten the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, I I mean, I guess in a sense, I mean, the point that I'm making from this like sexuality point of view is that it's, I mean, they are also convenient, you know, you don't have to go that far. You don't have to work that hard. Right. So yeah, you no longer have to buy dinner, you know, (laughs) I'm being yeah. cheeky, but you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. You're already in the same bed, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that's right. So, so tell, tell, all right, I'm, I'm getting a little punchy already. So what, um, what other things have you found? So I, first of all, I want to commend you for saying, okay, well, let's just look at other things that predict happy singlehood. You know, and so like even just starting with the premise that singlehood for some people is seen as good, positive and opportunity and so on. What else is there? Um, I mean, we're one of the, I mean, one of the big insights and, you know, uh, we haven't been doing this for too long. So in terms of like, you know, what have we actually published? The sexuality stuff is most of what we've been publishing, Mm -hmm. but you know, one of the I, one of the big questions, really, in the in that that we're thinking about as singlehood researchers right now is that um, you know what makes somebody want to choose to be single? Because I think that you know both in like informal discussions and um, you know when you when you look through the literature, I think that's that's the assumption, right? Is that it's all about is singlehood a choice for you or not? And if you're choosing it, you're probably going to be a happier single person than if you're not choosing it. Um, but we've also, you know, we've also taken a, definitely a bit of a cue from Bella in all of this and thinking about well, what's making people choose to be in relationships, you know, because I think that part of this relationship narrative, and I think that the relation, like relationship researchers are such romantic people um, that as a group, we tend to feel like life is a bit of a Disney movie. And the reason that people are going for relationships is that we have this deep, evolved need to belong and it just feels so good. And, and like that's part of the reason why some people get into relationships. But I think one of the things that this whole discourse around singlehood has made clear is that there's a lot of societal pressure to get in relationships. There's a lot of family pressure to get in relationships. And so, um, you know, we're starting to look at if you are single, um, you know, what's your motivation? I mean, both for both for being single and for staying in relationships. Um, so that's kind of like work in progress. I don't have like a lot of results, but I mean, to me, that's the big question at this point. Like, what makes somebody choose to be single? What are the factors that play into that? Um, because I think that's going to be really important figuring out. Because um, I do, I, you know, I think that Bella's point about the single at heart people. Um, I absolutely think that there's lots of those people out there, and we want to understand the motivations of those people. So we're doing some really wonky, nerdy stuff to like try to sort that out. But uh, the, the findings are uncooked at this point. So yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, I was also thinking about kind of the other side of this coin is uh, we talked a lot about people being motivated to get into relationships and find relationships and seek out relationships. But I'm also we talked about this a few weeks ago, Peter, over email interested in whether you think single people also differ to the degree that they stay in relationships. All right. So when you think about why people stay in relationships, and I'm thinking about this model, this kind of commitment model that came from this question. I worked with Carol Rosbold when I was a graduate Mm -hmm. student, and she told us this story that she was on a road trip and her friend asked her, so you study relationships. So why do people stay in relationships? And, and this was basically the basis of her, her a big chunk of her research is that people stay in relationship, not just because they're satisfied, but also because they have money and time invested. Oh, you know all this or because they don't have alternatives. Mm-hmm. And then Peter and me were talking and especially if, you know, single people have are well connected and maybe they are economically independent, especially mm-hmm. for women this is more and more important, of course, then yeah, if it's not fun, you're just going to leave, right? Because it's going to be about satisfaction or not. And I was wondering if, if we consider that 
single people are not single their whole life, but they actually might have been in relationships and have mm-hmm. decided to leave them. Do they differ in how they commit themselves? Jeff, before you answer that, we all know this model, but other people don't. So I just want to try to hit the highlights of it if I can. So Russ Bolt essentially said, at the time, I think the, the common thinking was, if you're happy with your relationship, you stay in it. If you're unhappy, you leave it. And And her contribution was... No, no, no. There's also this idea of like, what else might I do? What is, what are the other relationships that I might enter? What do they look like? Um, are they good or bad? Are there opportunities? And then also, how much have I invested in this thing? How much time have I spent? How much have our lives, um, kind of come together? And what do I have to give up as a result of that? We've got to, we, we got to, um, Got to sell the house, right? Like, you know, there's all this kind of thing. And it's why, for example, the merging element of uh, the relationship escalator ends up keeping people together, right? Like, we now share bank accounts. We now share a whole group of friends. Who gets the dog, right? Like, I mean, Mm -hmm. I have had people who have to fight over who gets the dog when the relationship ends and so on. And so, so her... Um, real contribution is this idea that like it's much more complex than just are you happy or not happy. Yeah, and the reason that this was so important is because people couldn't understand, especially one example was battered women, right? Mm-hmm. Why do battered women stay in relationships that are obviously, you know, abusive and can't by no means be satisfying fine to them? And then she added these elements, these other factors that that um kind of predicted the level of commitment which predicted the relationship. Yeah. Last thing I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I have an ex whose mom is really mean, mean to her daughter, sadly. And, uh, and when she met me, um, the mom met me, she said to the daughter, he doesn't need you. So her view was I'm, I'm going to be hard to keep around because it was, it's not enough for her for the daughter, my girlfriend, to be so delightful and such a wonderful human being, there needs to be something else that's going to keep this man around. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I can't cook for myself or I can't, you know what I mean? Whatever it is that's that's there. And that's sort of implicit a little bit in this this model, um, Mm. I think. Yep. Yep, for sure. For sure. I didn't realize, Iris, that you had worked with Carol Rusbold, who like, I've made a vow not to have heroes, but if I had heroes, Carol would be one of them. She was unbelievably amazing person. She was just she was just fire to be around. Um, she was fantastic. Um, she kept a bottle of tequila in her drawer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like this person. <laughs> she took she took me and some people on a tour of Amsterdam coffee shops, and it was a fun day. It was a fun yeah. day. Yeah, um, she was super fun, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, relationships are sticky, right? And I think that that was for sure. That was one of Carol's contributions is that, you know, for investment reasons, um, you know, relationships are sticky. And once you get in them, they can be, if you want to get out of them, it can still be kind of hard to do so. The relationship escalator points are that I'm with my uh, former student, uh, Samantha Jewell, we're writing a paper uh, on what she's called the progression bias, which is that people just tend to get swept up into the into relationships, you know? And it's it's funny. One of the things I've been thinking about is- yeah, we've been I call it the today. whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Again, a more quick passionate- sense, Quick scent. <laughs> more passionate versions of my dry academic titles for this. I, it's, I feel so alive today. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, it occurs to me, right? Like, I mean, maybe this is one of the benefits of society opening its mind a little bit to, like, maybe people aren't supposed to be in relationships, is that if the default societal expectation is that you get in them, like, the thing that I keep thinking about is, you know, when I teach about sexuality in my class, um, you know, a lot of people who are now in same-sex tract, like, same-sex relationships have tried sex with people of the other sex. Like, the reverse is much less often true, that when the societal expectation is you're supposed to be having sex with people of the other sex, people just kind of try that first because, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And it strikes me that there's something very analogous here where even if you are a person who's single at heart, when the societal norm is, well, I guess I'm supposed to be dating and so that's what I'm going to be doing, and then you pair that with this investment model kind of perspective of, but it's sticky, you know, it's hard to get out of those. And so people who sort of aren't supposed to be in relationships, it's not hard to imagine them finding themselves in this situation where 15, 20, you know, years down the road, they're like, this isn't what I was supposed to do. But it's so hard to extricate yourself because you've got to sell the house because you've got two kids with this person now, you know, all of these different factors. 
So, so right around when we're taping this, um, Bill and Melinda Gates announced that they're getting divorced. Think about that for a moment, <clears throat> right? Like how difficult that must be to extricate yourself from that partnership, right? One that is not just loving, but is also business that is also that has implications for whether people live and die, uh, you know, with regard to this, uh, this foundation and so on. And so, um, no uh, prenup I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, there always is a prenup. It's just whether the government um, has has created it for you or uh, or you've created it for yourself. Um, I'm quoting a previous guest on that. Um, anything else about the the Rust Bolt model um, in terms of uh, this idea of singlehood, right? Like, I, I don't know. I'm curious what either Iris for you bringing that up or Jeff, your observations with regard to the work. I mean, the other thing that occurs to me about it is, I mean, one of the things that I really like about this investment model is that it's um, it's broadly applicable. Like, it was actually for something that was done is in work context, and so it's like, why do you get stuck in jobs that you don't mm. want? And it's not always because you're happy with a job; it's for the exact same things. So it is. I mean, for for people listening to this, it's it's kind of a useful broad tool. And the thing is, is you could apply it to singlehood too. You know, there's you make investments in singlehood. You know, so lots of people talk about, for example, you start podcasts they, on the topic. A hundred and ten percent. I mean, imagine, right? Like, if you all of a sudden like got into a monogamous relation, it's not good for your brand, is what I'm saying. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, it is it is a useful theory that way, and there are things even if you love singlehood. Um, you know, there's also ways in which you're committed to it in various ways, and so things like friendship networks, or um, you know, and it also, I mean, this is, and I think it's the alternatives part of it that all of the debate is around, right? Is that like I think society says that you're supposed to think that you have better alternatives to being single, and that's I think what's up for grabs right now, and I think some people don't have better alternatives to being single because they love it, you know, yeah. and, and some people can't find someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I was the, thinking about that also today, this. reading your paper. Like there, there are also we talk about single by choice, right? But that yeah. single by choice or single by not choice. But I think for some people, it's not. A I call choice. it single by chance, by the way. Yeah, or single by chance. Yeah, and some people are just uncoupleable. Let's say. I mean, there are just people who, are, who can't connect, who have something which makes them, yeah, really difficult to. Um, pair, pair off with somebody. Yeah. Um, it's a and difficult do, group to study. Sorry. I, there are I, people who are so miserable. They are miserable, miserable people. And if they coupled up, they're just going to make someone else incredibly miserable. Right. You know, I mean, as you said, there are lots of different, we call it heterogeneity, mm -hmm. you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, it's not clear that that person is better off. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly the person next to them is not better off at the very least, no. right? <laughs> or the world. But I do think, you know, I do think, <laughs> I do think that this is where, you know, when I talk about Bella and I coming from like slightly different starting points on this, I think this is where attachment theory has informed my approach to studying singlehood. Is that as much as I, you know, I, I totally agree with a lot of what we've been talking about. That it's important to remember that there's lots of people who want to be single. I'm always also mindful of that. There's lots of people who don't want to be single, yes. and that's the part that they struggle with, and because they have you know emotional problems or they're you know not attractive in various ways or whatever situation they're in. And I guess that's kind of a constituency that I always like to make sure that I'm keeping an eye on. The people who like, um, you know, there's lots of people who want to be in relationships and that's not available to them in various ways. And those are single people too. And I want to make sure that my research pays attention to those people as well. Yeah, well said. And I, I do think the issue is like that we don't teach people the skills around. Well, some of this stuff is like there's some basics of how do you make yourself more attractive, right? A, right? More appealing. B, how do you go about the actual process of meeting people and improving that? And then how do you go about maintaining something once you have it, you know, that's there? And, and, and these things are not always intuitive, um, you know, this, that, that, uh, that exists. So, and also, I mean, again, sometimes people want it, then they don't want it, then they want it. They don't like, you know, they turn it on and off, like, 
you know, depending on what their situation is like, what they have going on with regard to their work, their artistic pursuits, um, the, a pandemic, et cetera, that's there. So as we wrap up, what I'd like to do um, for a moment um, is just a, a tiny extension of a little bit of what I would call editorializing, right? So we've talked a lot about findings um, and, and some of the implications. And I want to kind of ask sort of each of us to do a, a kind of takeaway observation um, either from this conversation or from the work more generally um, that might be useful for a listener specifically, right, that's there. And I, I am I am willing to start, but I also would want to see um, if there's a volunteer in my between the two of you who wants to begin with uh, with the takeaway. All right, I'll start then. I I want to say that I think uh, again, this is building on what you just said, Jeff, which is, and this is not a podcast that is anti-relationship in, in any way. It really is one that, um, that tries to get people to see their time on this planet as single people, which by the way, is a lot of time as, as not in any way inferior to time on this planet in a partnership. And whether that be that you are in pursuit of a partnership and going to change your status or you're not, and again, whether that be for now or forever, that um, that people recognize the advantages that exist within that, you know, and I think that that we've used this term story. Um, and I think the stories that we tell ourselves can shape not only our happiness, our satisfaction with being single people, but it also can um, shape the way we approach relationships. So, so I, I mean, the most intoxicating uh, thing that a person can have is to be confident and to be comfortable with who they are. Desperation is a terrible scent to have when you're dating, because what it does is it takes someone who um, may be interested in dating you and it introduces a question, which is why is this person interested in me? If they're interested in me because they need me to solve their problems, that's not as pure an intention as they they want me because I am a potentially good partner. And so I don't actually see much conflict in what we're doing here because I think that if we elevate single living, we actually elevate the chance for someone to partner in a way that is more healthy. Right. It's not as a I'm going to solve a problem approach to 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 relationships. So that's my bit of editorializing. Um, I'm curious now. I'm Now I need a real volunteer. I'll, I'll hop in there because that actually dovetails really well which, with what I think is just my general takeaway message from all of this, which is I mean, and again, it's a, you know, it goes back to what I'd said earlier about um, I think that the people who do best at being in relationships are the people who do best at being single. And these are the people who, um, and this is, you know, one of the interesting things to me in the relationship literature right now is there's a whole bunch of data that's coming back that seems to be showing that a lot more of your happiness in relationships isn't about picking the right person, but it's about being the right person. Mm -hmm. It's about being someone who can be calm and emotionally stable and as happy as it's possible for you. Um, and that, you know, that there's no quick fix for becoming that kind of a person. I mean, some people, the secure people got randomly assigned to that and congratulations, I hope that you're enjoying it. Um, but for a lot of people, it's a struggle to get to that place, right? And there's no quick fix. You know, there's no app that's going to make you feel better this way tomorrow. There's no relationship that's going to take all of that and completely convert it. That becoming the kind of person who is a healthy person alone as and is a healthy person in a relationship, I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, would you expect to develop 26-inch biceps by going to the gym for one day? You would mm -hmm. not, right? If you want to be that kind of person, you need to make long, slow investments in it. And I think that when you do that, you start deprioritizing the question of am I single or am I in a relationship? You start listening to what actually makes you happy and then you follow whatever that path is and that might be being single or that might be being in a relationship. But hopefully you get to a place where you're content and without, you know, with or without basically, you know. So yeah, I mean, that, this is what I would say to my relationship class students is, yeah, don't focus on finding the right person, focus on becoming the right person and, and that'll help you no matter what you do. Excellent. 
Yeah, I think that's such a beautiful phrase. I saw the, uh, I heard this at a wedding a few years ago. The father of the bride said, um, to find the right person, you have to be the right person. And then he was referring to his daughter as being the right person, but also the husband, of course. Oh, yeah, that guy, you know, the prop in the in the wedding, you know. <laughs> My daughter's accessory. But they were both the right person. Um, also, a little bit, Jeff, what you said, people taking care of themselves. Ultimately, you can talk about, you know, categorizing people in terms of how they deal with their relationships. But I... I think that it's basically more about being healthy or unhealthy and unhappy or unhappy with yourself and with your life. And I think what is really great about this podcast, uh, what Peter is doing is saying, you know, this is not a waiting station. This mm -hmm. is not a bus station where you sit until the next person, you know, this is part of your life where you can actually work on discovering your values, living the life that you think is, is important and is remarkable. Um, and then somebody will come along or not. And it doesn't really matter so much it's more uh it's not a bus station bus stations suck right it's more like an airport lounge where it's like it's already kind of <laughs> great they're great to be hanging out there you know <laughs> i don't know how you travel but i, I need to upgrade <laughs> i need to upgrade i think <laughs> exactly. my air travel <laughs> you you should it's worth the it's worth the it's worth the price of admission typically um, wow. That Iris, that's super well said. I think that's super well said. Um, well, okay, this is uh, we have gone long. Maybe we'll split this into two. I don't know. We'll see. But that is always a, a sign of an excellent uh, podcast. Um, Jeff, uh, thank you for bearing with us in terms of uh, of um, holding back some of your nerdiness, so we can we can celebrate our um, our single uh, listeners. Um, I, you're, the work you're doing is really outstanding. It's really important. And, um, uh, and I like your perspective that you are kind of studying a moving target, actually. And in many ways, the research you're doing is moving the target, right? You know, is this idea that, that, um, pointing out that this, uh, that, that single life is, uh, first of all, really complex. There are lots of different people who are doing it. They're doing it in different ways. They have different motivations. Um, they have different experiences. And to validate those experiences um, by not just overly judging them as being deficient is important. And especially as your work finds its way into uh, the kind of real world, whether it be through podcasts and, and media and so on. So I want to say thank you for that. I appreciate that. And then Iris, I, I just love having you as a guest co-host because as a fellow nerd, um, you actually read the papers and um, and even know some of the people that we talk about. I think that's really cool that you know um, Russ Bolt uh, that's there. And, uh, and and so I really uh, I really appreciate having your voice on this podcast. Thank you. And with that, we're going to wrap up. And as I always, I like to say, cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.org. Please subscribe and share with your single friends.